everybody. It's late, so I'm going to talk loud, keep you guys awake. Uh, I'm Jem, Jem Young. I'm tall. I'm an engineer. That uh, about sums it up for me. Uh, I'm going to talk about testing and the build process. Yeah, I can hear the groan inside. People are like, testing. Oh, man, that sucks. I know, right? But I'm going to tell you why it doesn't suck that much. All right, testing. Why bother? Right? Right. You're saying, Jim, I'm a young, scrappy startup. We're going to change the world. We don't need a test. We need to iterate fast. We need to break things. That's what they say at Google. I'm like, yeah, I was like that too at one time. You don't want to be do this when your code goes down. You really don't want to. <laughs> yeah, that's me and Harry. That was, the code wasn't going down, but uh, yeah, you don't want to be like that. Uh, so when I say testing, what sort of testing are we talking about? I remember in school they were like, Jim, you need to know about black box testing, white box testing, regression testing, functional testing, all this sort of testing. I'm like, man, I am going to be the fattest engineer alive. I don't write any bugs. The people that work with me won't write any bugs. Man, I don't need to test. That's all bull. <laughs> so the older I get, the more mature uh, engineer I become, the more I realize I didn't know Jack when I was in school, and now I know a little bit more. So uh, yeah, you want to write tests, and I'll go on and tell you more why. Uh, so why tests? The unit test, the most basic uh, level of testing, tests the function essentially. Um, so anybody can see what's the error in this code here? Anybody? People up front? It's okay. It's really small. So the problem is this should return a boolean. It actually returns a string. Uh, so a simple like linting or static analysis wouldn't catch that. But a unit test, which takes 30 seconds to write, would have caught that in a second. So that's one reason why you test, to catch easy errors like that, especially unit tests. End-to-end -end tests. Uh, so your pipeline, I'm sure, is uh, ours is very complicated. It's long. Uh, so the, the part from writing your code to actually deploying it live, it's probably many, many steps. So along the way, stuff can break. So end-to-end -end tests help test, like, did your code actually make it live, and is it what the user's supposed to see? So end-to-end -end tests are good. I'll talk a little bit more about those. But end-to-end uh, -end tests, oh. That button should have been blue. No, it should have been red. It's blue right now. <laughs> See? Bad testing. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our stack. Um, we use Jasmine. Jasmine is a uh, testing framework, very popular. I'm sure many of you uh, use it. Uh, comparable to, say, Mocha or QUnit, stuff like that. Um, we use Karma. Karma is a test runner. Uh, for those not familiar, Karma essentially aggregates all your files, throws them at Jasmine. Uh, it has some nice configuration, but Karma is kind of what it de facto goes to. Uh, Protractor. Protractor does our end-to-end, -end, uh, written by Angular guys. Uh, also uses Jasmine, so another good reason to use Jasmine. Uh, Jenkins. Jenkins is our continuous integration server. Um, very popular as well. I'll get more into that later. Uh, and Selenium. Selenium runs our pinger tests. And you're saying, what's the pinger? Well, uh, the code that, when you go to the New York Times, that gets loaded up, the Chirpy JS code, that's our pinger. It essentially pings back to us. And we test that pretty thoroughly. This isn't about that because it's not written in Angular, it's written in Vanilla JavaScript. Uh, thanks to Mr. Bowman. But uh, it's downloaded over 277 billion times a year. So you want to make sure it works. Because if it breaks for even like a day, that's millions of people that the code doesn't work right for. Uh, so I'll talk about some easy wins with AngularJS testing because you're like, I don't want to write tests, but if I do, I want to learn how to do it better. Cool. I'm the man to talk to. So. GitHub hooks. Uh, anybody familiar with what a webhook is? Nobody? A few people. All right, cool. All right, so essentially a webhook is you say, you say some service like GitHub. You say, hey, uh, whenever something happens, call back to this API with some data. That's it. It's very simple. It's cool. GitHub hooks, you should use them if you use GitHub. Uh, I believe GitLab and Git Bitbucket have some too. I'm not so sure on that. But essentially what happens is when I push some code in the master, uh, GitHub says, hey, Jen just pushed some code in the master, and then we can kick off a whole series of tests to match that. So it helps with integration testing. Uh, here's a good link if you want to read about it. It's really simple to implement. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But essentially, you can add this, this little thing comes in here, too. Um, yeah. But uh, so if the tests fail, this will turn yellow or gray, which says, like, test fail. And it's a nice way to, like, open a pull request and see, like, my code integrated properly. Uh, Make your test idempotent or idempotent, depending on where you went to school. Uh, you're saying, what the F is that? I'll have a degree in CS. That's cool. Uh, essentially means every time you throw data at a function or something, it should come out 
the same way every time. And you're saying, oh, duh, <laughs> Jim, I've been engineering for years now. I know that. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize if I offend anybody. But <laughs> so where this comes into play is like, say you have uh, some service that calls um, one of your APIs. That's cool. Um, but what happens when the API goes down? Oh, your test failed. Your build blocks. Oh, the whole thing's backed up. So you don't want to use APIs for something like uh, for testing like that. So what you want to do is use ng mocks. Ng mocks allows you to say like, oh, you can fake a backend essentially. So I'm going to fake a call to Sharpie.com and then return some fake data to go with that. But essentially means like your test will be the same every time, so that data never changes because your API didn't change because it's not a real API. But as far as your functions are concerned, it's the fully working uh, Angular app. Um, there's a link to uh, ng mock. You guys can check it out. Uh, comments in your code. Oh yeah, this is one of my favorites. So, like, quick, I, I can cover this up. Anybody tell me what this function does? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but with comments, man, it's right there. It's all right there for you. Um, and I'll give you a gem pro tip. If you're ever applying for a job at Sharpie and we give you a code test, just comment your code. I promise you'll be able to top the list. So many people don't comment. I'm very passionate about this. Uh, so we use JSDoc here for commenting, and you're saying, why comments? My code's awesome, I'm awesome, you're not so awesome. I'm like, that hurts, man, but it's cool, I, I can feel it. Uh, but you comment because like a week from now, you're probably not gonna remember what you did, and you're like, man, I gotta write a unit test for this. Well, a comment makes it so like, oh, I know exactly what the parameters are for that test, I know what will return. It took me a whole 30 seconds to write. Uh, Doc Locker, for those of you not familiar and who use Sublime, which I know is a popular front end tool, um, doc blocker is essentially slash star star enter and it skeletons out this whole thing for you. So you really don't have a good reason not to be commenting. Um, a plus commenting code is just beautiful to look at. Challenges. This is supposed to be a GIF, but GIFs don't work that well because of drive for some reason. But uh, as a Jaguars fan and an engineer, I've also been like, what what are they doing? Like, why do they suck so bad? Why do I suck so bad? That's this guy. I'm calling confused guy since this thing doesn't work. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to test a directive, you're like, man, this is hard. I can, I can test filters, no problem. I can test controllers. I can test services. But a directive's hard, man. That's a template. And that's Angular stuff. And, you know, ah, uh, uh, don't worry. I'm going to tell you something. You compile the template. You put in a DOM and you test it like normal. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's easy. But it took me a while to figure that out. I'm not the world's smartest man. Uh, so it's like a paradigm shift when I figure this out. So essentially what you want to do is you take your template or your directive, you compile it to an Angular element, you append it to the DOM, and then you just compile it just like normal uh, Angular would do when you're normally loading a page. So it really, and then you just test it normally as normal describes, things like that. But doing that makes life so much easier. And that was like the last big hurdle we had to overcome when running tests was how do you test directives? How do you test components? This is the way to do it. Um, I can send you a copy of this code if you guys ever need it. Another challenge, uh, you've got 100,000 tests, uh, you have a great engineering team, you guys are like on it, awesome. But when you run the test, that's a good question. Well, our old friend Jenkins, the continuous integration server, and my old friend Justin Lentz, one of our web ops, he wrote a thing called Justkins, which essentially, to boil it down, Justkins is a post-commit hook listener. So essentially, those web hooks we talked about earlier, it makes a callback to our API, and that kicks off some build jobs. We say, oh yeah, that's easy. What Justin does that's extra special is it checks the directories that were modified. It only runs a test that you, on the code you change. So before it was like, code comes back, all the tests run. Code comes back, all the tests run. And I'm like, why am I running Django tests when I just wrote some JavaScript? Justin's fixed that. And it gives you, uh, using uh, Jenkins, you can get like a nice build history. You can know when the build breaks. Um, and generally, I'm the guy that finds you when you break the builds, because I just don't like broken builds. But now we're good now. So that's what I call uh, a winning combination. Production builds. Let's talk a little bit about builds now. Uh, so to ship your code, I'm hoping people do something like this. If not, that's cool. I'm not going to judge you. But so the, the, we have steps to go through. And you're like, JavaScript. JavaScript's not compiled. I know. But there's still stuff you have to do. So you got to lint it, you got to clean it, you got to other you got to compile the list, compile the templates, put it all together, push it out the master, push it out to your CDN. I'm like, man, that's a lot of stuff. And I'll tell you, I am lazy. I am so lazy. You got to do this eight, eight times a day? Man, that sucks. What can we do about that? 
Hmm. Oh, we can use grunts. Grunts, the JavaScript task runner. Notorious now, or infamous, should I say. Uh, I don't know, anybody use grunt before? Familiar with it? Yeah, a lot of people, it's very popular. Grunt's pretty cool. Um, so we started, it solves all the problem, it runs all the tasks for you. Um, but man, you know what the problem with grunt is? Those configuration files. If someone hasn't built it for you, you're like, what the F am I doing, man? I'm like, look at, look at this code. Like, I couldn't tell someone who just started, but like, hey, man, just fix that grunt thing. <laughs> no, like, you look at this, and it's not, it's not clear at all. So, oh, confused guy again. Yeah, <laughs> and the Jaguars. It's actually sad at time. So what do we do? We switch to gulp. Why gulp? Gulp is synchronous or asynchronous. So it's streaming, so it's faster. And it's simpler, because it's just vanilla JavaScript, no configuration. For instance, here's a gulp task. Oh. See, it's just a function. Like, anybody can go in there and say, like, I want to go task to uh, turn all the images on the website and the kitties. Oh, we can, we can do that for you. Because go tasks are just, it's just a function. You throw it in your, uh, your build process. Done. We should do that for uh, April Fool's. Anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, so gulp is fantastic. If you guys are using grunt, think about like, switching to gulp unless you have, like, some deep love for uh, some grunt. That's cool. Uh, so another thing for Gulp is we just have one base file. So as Harry alluded to earlier, all of our products, um, they have their, sorry, I'm gonna step back. We have one Gulp file. Cause, because there's certain things you wanna do every time. You wanna be able to build, compile, minify, other stuff like that. So we have one uh, Gulp file. So each application has its own Gulp file. So let's say I have something very specific I need to do for this one dashboard, we can put it in there. And through inheritance, uh, whenever I go to compile the advertising directory, this still has all the functionality that everything else has, but it has a little bit extra on top just to make it sweet. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said before, gulp task for everything. Gulp task, easy to read. Uh, it's just JavaScript. Um, literally, for all the front end, they do everything for us. Uh, and the last bit of advice is automate everything you can. Uh, so this is a finish uh, Jenkinsville. This is part of our uh, Gulp build. And so what we have is we have Jenkins hooked in the GitHub, which compiles all the code, commits it back, and then notifies that notifies our hip chat room or uh, get the other ones. Thank you. Yeah, or Slack, whatever you want. Like, so essentially, like it's automated and it's running and it's doing all this work for you, but you can still be notified so it's, things aren't just going crazy and Jenkins is just throwing out code left and right. But again, uh, Jenkins, highly recommend it. Um, need some free advice on it? I will come talk to you for free. Uh, yeah, that's it. Jim Young, Jim Young on Twitter. Um, I'll take questions later, but yeah. All right, no take questions. Take questions now. Oh, I'll take questions now. Nobody, all right. <laughs> So you want to establish, like, first off, you want to establish what you want to test. Because end-to-end tests are, like, so broad. I mean, they test pretty much your entire stack. Yeah. Well, they test the function of your entire stack. So that's mainly what we do. So I sit down with my QA engineer, and we say, um, what are you trying to test exactly? Um, we set up some core functionality, such as, um, like, your robot that wants to log into the website every time. Like, yeah. you want to extrapolate that out. And so, like, you want to make your test so you can inherit all this stuff and then just write the functionality you need. For instance, like if I'm testing one dashboard, I write out a specific test for that, but like overall the site, I'll have code that I inherit from there. Sorry, it's a little. To be like page objects? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, that's just that's a, that's a pattern for a Oh, I'll check that out. Different, yeah, definitely end to end is like one of our newer forays into things. Like yeah, it's different for me too, so that's kind of why. I, yeah. Let's learn together, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Have you looked at robot framework? Robot framework. For Selenium. Uh, Danny, actually, the guy that's walked out, can speak more to that. Um, do we? We don't use mechanize or anything like that, do we? Uh, no. Selenium it mainly runs on um, what's the big testing browser stack? Fossilize. 
Sauce Labs. Labs, thank you. You guys are on it today. Yeah, so it runs on Sauce Labs, so it tests on all the browsers, and Selenium just, I believe it just kicks off those jobs for us. Um, not really a question, but a comment. Uh, if you really like um, so what they call streaming kind of like typing, um, there's Nightwatch.js, which uh, does like WebDriver.js with Selenium, um, where you can do end to end testing. Because I found Protractor to be like a little bit too cop side for me, like, like it's a little bit hardcore. So um, yeah, you can just uh, uh, set up your test for all the different browsers and watch it just drive right through. Right? I'll check that out. Yeah, that is one of the problems with Protractor. It's very opinionated on how you should do the test. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't know, I like a little flexibility when I have that test. Uh, yeah. How do you handle promises in your intent test? Promises? Oh. Uh, Funny story, we actually haven't got that far yet. Uh, but I will have another talk when we get to that point. <laughs> Sorry, and the test we're not so strong on. Do you, do you test for a browser? Oh, we do. So mainly for our pinger, because that's our most heavily used code, we test across, uh, I don't know, like how many different browsers? 96, 7, 8. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it, keep it coming, keep it coming. Yeah. Yeah, so. That, that's one of the things that like needs to work. Uh, we, we set out like a bare minimum for compatibility for our dashboards. So IE9, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, that's pretty much what we test across. For our unit tests, um, not really. Our end to 10 tests, we do test across those, but yeah. Uh, what do you like manually pull out these browsers when you run your Why is all the people who worked on this stuff? That. Yeah, Selenium does that. Um, Oh, no, that's fine. Good question. I mean, sometimes you have to do it manually, too, but Sauce Labs. No, for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, initially, how do you enforce uh, like writing on beta testing? Does a way engineer do it and like, somebody make sure it's kind of like a metric that you're hit, or you just shut through everyone? Code coverage. Yeah, that, my friend, is a great question. So, <laughs> testing is a problem in any startup, because, you know, Let's face it, we all have a limited amount of runway and we all have a certain amount of engineering time we need to get work done. So my thing is like, we don't, at Charpy, we're pretty loose on it. Like we're not gonna make you write tests, but it's def definitely encouraged. Like, but we're not gonna stop your workflow to write a test. Um, our common stuff is very well tested. Our products are pretty well tested as well, but not as well as I'd like, obviously. Um, but no, like there's nothing like making somebody. It's more like we're all like a good team and we just, wouldn't do that to someone else. You know, when the code breaks, you're like, oh crap, I shouldn't have had a test. I know, it works for a small team. We'll see how it scales in the future, but yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks guys.